in the black box over here. Um, there are cities from all over the state that are participating now. So welcome. This is a Green Step uh, Cities workshop. Was anybody here for uh, learning how to cook Thai food? Because you're in the wrong place. Although I can do that. I need a mirror up on my, anyway. Um, cooking, uh, yeah. <laughs> the cooking corner. So um, welcome, Tuesday morning. Um, for those of you not in the 612 in Minneapolis, it is still raining purple. Um, and uh, so it's raining here, and but we're happy to be here on a Tuesday in May for, um, we annually do a transportation type uh, workshop um, in the spring because it seems like, I don't know, a time where people are thinking about transit, especially alternative transit, um, biking, etc. So we're really, really happy to um, be here today. Um, the partner host is the Transit for Livable Communities which we love working with and have for uh, years and years and years, and congratulations on um, Jessica Treat. What a yeah. nice choice. Um, so uh, for folks, if you can see, there's a hashtag. Please don't let me be the only person tweeting today. Um, I just feel lonely space sometimes. So hashtag Green Step, WKSHP. Um, you can follow the Green Step Cities um, Twitter or mine, Longfellow Die. Um, we'll be tweeting and see if we can have a party. Um, so I think I'm going to turn it over to Hillary. Um, and I, I do also want to just say, oh, after Phil in a second here, um, XL Energy is our series sponsor. They've sponsored all the workshops this year. So big, huge thanks to XL Energy, um, Minnesota for that. And Phil? I'm going to turn it over to you. Oh, oh, I just wanted to say, uh, can we just have everyone introduce themselves? I'm going to sure, we can do that. Um, yeah, let's start in the room. So people on the phones, we're going to go around the room and say where we're, who we are and where we're from. Uh, Will Delaney, um, I work for the whole community and I live in Minneapolis. Uh, I'm Maddie Norgard, I work at Great Plains Institute. I'm Ashley Walter and I'm with the city of Delano. Hannah Flynn, I'm Community Development Director for the City of Big Lake. Michael Healy, I'm the City Planner. Sergeant Becky, I'm the First Team Building, and we work with all the jury I'm Sarah Sollinger, I'm from the City of Big Lake. Nice. Another music. Peter Lindstrom, Clean Energy Resource Teams, and Mayor of South Bay. Mark Golan, the City of Edina. Chris Iverson of the City of St. Louis Park. Philip Music at the MCTA, the Green Step Coordinator. Livable Community, St. Paul. Shelly Chamberlain, Minnesota Council of Nonprofits, St. Paul. Patrick Mathewick, GPI. And um, I'm Diana McHugh, and I um, direct the metro region of CERT, the Clean Energy Resource Teams at the Great Plains Institute, and I do a lot of the air traffic controlling of. Um, work with the, the 11 county metro area, Green Step Cities. And I do just want to say um, we passed 100 um, in March, and we're actually up to 108, and there's several new. Um, super cool. Very excited. Um, uh, so, yeah, thank you. And we have one more workshop for the year, and it's associated with the LMC um, uh, annual meeting conference that will be in June. So it's June 14th, 
It's 130 to 430. 130 to 430. You can see I organized it, right? Um, and um, so it's going to be about ecotourism and uh, eco um, development, business development, and uh, communities. And you can look up for more on the agenda, but that's the last one for the year. Um, don't forget, we'll have evaluations. And if you um, have any suggestions for future workshops, we're really, really open to suggestions. We're working on the topics for next year. So that was really long. Sorry, but that seemed all really necessary. Because this is our last one here that I'm running. So uh -oh. thanks for a great year. Yeah, maybe I would like to thank my supporting cast, uh -huh. Philip and Patrick and mm -hmm. Peter. So go ahead, yeah. Philip. Well, maybe I should just add. So registration for that last workshop, that last Green Cup workshop, um, is through at, when you go to the Green Cup website in the uh, news box, you'll see you know register for workshops. Um, for that workshop, you'll actually go, you'll click on a link uh, to register for the LC conference. But I just went ahead and did it. And if you're just coming to the Green Set celebration, June 15th, and the workshop, and or the workshop June 14th, you'll click through a few screens and you end up with, you know, zero charge. So it is a free, you don't have to pay that if you're not able to come to the whole LC conference. You can register for this three hour special workshop and it's free. So. At the River Center in St. Paul. River Center. So super exciting, and that's when we do awards, and it's super exciting to be over 100. That's just fun. So uh, I think then I will turn it over to Ms. Hillary Reeves, who is the queen of transportation um, and all things good, bicycling, walking, all the things um, from Transit for Livable Communities. Thank you so much. Thank you. But yes, thank you. I'm Hillary from Transit for Livable Communities. Um, thanks for having me today. I want to thank Philip, uh, especially for putting this on the program for this year and, and um, making this a part of the Green Step City lineup. Um, and also Patrick for the help getting everything rolling today. Uh, thank you, the clicker. Um, so, um, where did I go? So this is just basically the mindset that I'm coming at this with. Uh, our communities are shaped by how we get around, and we are shaped by that in turn. Um, so that's just a philosophy um, that underpins some of the thinking that you're going to have here. Um, so there are new green step new for green step cities, um, and these come out of a program that we launched last year with the Minnesota Council of Nonprofits to try to establish transportation best practices within nonprofit organizations. We decided to try to take a, a kind of sector-based approach. Um, we were also looking at the fact that um, some new transportation options had come on board in the Twin Cities. And so the question was, how much are workplaces, and in this case, nonprofit workplaces, um, accommodating those new options? Uh, transit, bicycling, walking, sharing options. Um, so that was our goal, was to, to look at that and to try to encourage uh, organizations to reassess what they might be doing. Um, so in the process of the year, we certified 20 organizations as transportation leaders. Uh, and this is the list that you can see here. Uh, they range in size pretty, pretty widely. Um, the Amherst Wilder Foundation, um, Lutheran Social Service of Minnesota, those were some of the, the biggest. Uh, Minnesota Public Radio was another. Um, they were around the Twin Cities. Many of them were located along the Green Line, which just opened up last year, um, but some are not, like the community in South Minneapolis. Um, so we um, we had some funding for this from the uh, Met Council Congestion Mitigation and Air Quality, and um, with the underlying idea of trying to shift trips during the rush hour. Um, to try to deal with congestion on that front and pollution that comes from that. But we also took a, um, intentionally took a kind of broader look at how people get around during the day as well. Because the commute for some people is not something that's very easy to change. There are all kinds of factors involved with how you get to work, um, but some, some other things can shift with that. Um, so the all of these organizations did three basic things. They attended a Rethinking Transportation workshop 
which was a um, experiential workshop and uh, had a lot of um, specific learnings in it about things like compensation policies and how you can shift those. Um, also made sure that everybody in the workshop was familiar and sort of personally knew how to get on the bus and how to pay the fare and how to put a bike on the bus, um, how to ride the train, you know, how car sharing and bike sharing and electric vehicles work. Um, that, um, all of them did a travel behavior survey with their staff to try to establish a kind of mode share for the organization. And by mode share, wonky term, it's just the sense of um, what's the percentage of different ways of getting to work. Um, so we, we got that. And then all committed to at least six transportation best practices. Um, people certified at higher levels, multimodal more and, and max, did more things. And, and we've carried over those um, same steps for this Green Step Cities new transportation action, uh, Philip and I worked together to adapt them so that they would work beyond the core cities. Um, and that's, that's what we're going to present today. Our hope is that some of these, that, that hopefully at least one of the things that I mentioned today will be something that hits home with you and you say, oh, okay, that fits where I am and we can try that. Um, so that's, that's what I'm going to do today is run through first. Um, few of the reasons why you might be compelled or feel like you want to try some of these and then talk about what some of the steps are. And then I'm really glad to be joined today by Kelly Chamberlain from the Minnesota Council of Nonprofits and Will Delaney from Hope Community. Both went through the workshop and the whole certification process and they're going to tell us a little bit about what it looked like from within their organizations. And Will, uh, Hope Community also recently opened a new building called The Rose. Uh, in which the, the planning for multimodal access was very intentional from the outset. And I know um, community development managers at cities um, working with new employers or new residences um, might be interested to kind of think about this experience from the road. So we wanted to include that today. Um, okay, so. This is a map of the Twin Cities multimodal system. Um, it's definitely true that most of the 20 organizations that we certified have a lot of options at hand. Not all of the people, not all of the organizations were right on some of these systems. And importantly, their employees were often not on these systems. And so even, even when you have a, employ a workplace like the League of Minnesota Cities right here very nicely, situated on transit, um, and there's a bike boulevard about two blocks that way, um, Charles. Um, employees come from all over the metro, and so um, we don't really have, even in the metro, a transportation system, a, a bus system that reaches everybody on enough frequency that they can always depend on transit. So it's kind of a, a connection of like, where do you live at home and where do you go to work? Um, check my time. Um, but two key points um, that I want to make for the cities here. Many of the steps the organization apply in locations with fewer options. And so those are the ones we're focusing on here today. And some of, you, some of these uh, kinds of options are not limited to the metro. Um, bike sharing is showing up in communities around the state. So maybe coming later this year. Um, most of the Green Step cities um, have some kind of a bike network, or at least have promoted it within their communities. Oftentimes that's recreational in focus, but we're trying to kind of shift that um, and say, how can we use some of these recreational paths for the commute? Um, most Minnesota counties also have some form of transit. Um, it's not often very frequent. Um, <laughs> But there's great demand for it, um, and people are using it. Uh, there are certainly some nodes around the state where transit is a, is a factor. And I think, you know, like in Rochester, they're definitely looking to expand that with the des destination medical zone. Um, you know, Mankato has a great uh, transportation uh, transit plan that is just waiting for funding to be implemented. So where this is about kind of making the most of them and sort of as cities, can you look at the way that, that you're working with your employees, the way that 
you're orienting yourself to the community that you're in, and think about ways you might open up space for some of these kinds of activities, just to kind of signal that this is possible. Um, so that's, that's the, uh, the kind of frame that we have here. Um, so what's next? Um, I'm going to go through just for why you might um, take this on. Some of this is going to be very familiar to you all, so um, you can check the box as I run through them. Um, but firstly, if you're in the metro, traffic congestion is something everybody loves. Uh, you know, um, but traffic is a huge waste of time and productivity. Um, a lot of people have just kind of inured themselves to the commute. They just take it on every day and they do. It, it's, a, it's a big chunk of time out of people's day, and it also means that the time that they're in the car, they're not necessarily they're not really able to get the activity that they might like to have. So um, there's a study from the Atasca group from a business perspective that also looked at what would happen if you had more transit options. And it, the travel time savings is the wonky term, but it, it applies to businesses and to individuals. If you, can, if you can have more options, then you free up the space, a little bit of space on the highway, um, and you give uh, more control over the time. So the, the other thing about a long commute, and this is just for commutes of 10, 10 miles or more each day, is that it's just an increased number of health effects. Um, you know, cardiovascular fitness, blood sugar, higher blood pressure temporarily and over time, it would be good to get out of the car from time to time to the extent that you can you need to, you know, take care of life. Um, there's a lot of pollution, emissions from cars. Um, on the highway, uh, if you're bumper to bumper, you might, another reason to like give space on the highway between you and the next car is that 10 or 20 feet from the tailpipe can make a difference. Fine particulates you're breathing in and those fine particulates um, that are out there, they then lead to health and blood uh, cardiovascular issues. Um, they also contribute to greenhouse gas emissions. Um, transportation is 28%. Is um, most of the 62% of that comes from cars and trucks, light duty vehicles. In this other little here, the average vehicle emits almost a pound of CO2 for every mile driven. So this, to me, you know, sometimes when I'm thinking about how am I going to get somewhere, and I think, oh, I could drive, or I could take my bike, or I could take the train. I do have these options. It, it comes to mind. It's like, okay, it might take me 10 more minutes or a little bit longer on the bike, but I'm also incrementally saving a little carbon. So um, this next one, cost, is something state to the extent that people use them. Um, car ownership is uh, or transportation in general is one of the biggest uh, costs in the family budget. Um, I'll tell you a story about a woman uh, I talked to recently who lives in Minnetonka, I think. And she and her husband were both driving to work and they were looking at their family budget and they were saying, you know, this isn't really working. We do not have savings. Uh, and they were sort of just like right at the income. They figured out a way commuter bus into his job to drop their dog. Um, they got rid of one car and that became their savings. And that is a story that um, is just out there. You can have the money you need to pay a mortgage, put some money aside for college, pay off debt if you're a student. So in various communities, you know, around the metro and around the state, Thinking about what your employees might be struggling with in terms of household budget can be a reason to take on some of these transportation options and to be able to say, okay, if it's possible for you to ride your bike or to take a bus 
or to do a carpool, we understand that, you know, salaries are maybe not the best. Um, you as an employee can maybe have some more latitude if the city as an employer recognizes that, you know, you're not going to be here at 8.30 on the smack on the dock because your bus gets in at 8.45 or the bike, you know, if you ride your bike in, you're going to need a place to, to change to put your clothes during the day, that kind of thing. So um, just, just know that this is a big issue for people. Um, changing communities is the last point I want to make on this front. Um, we know in the metro that uh, this was an a op-ed in the paper this past weekend that CEOs of like 12 major employers said, we need multimodal options. This is how we attract young workers. This is how we have a metro that works. This is, but this kind of thinking is true across the state. There are communities um, that are trying to attract or retain their own young population. Uh, they're trying to deal with seniors who want to age in place. Um, having options is important and having safe communities for people to be able to get around is important. So you've, you've all taken steps as Green Step Cities. Okay, so now I'm going to talk a little bit more about how as Green Step Cities you could turn the focus back in on what you're doing as cities for your employees and in your practices to open up a little space for these multimodal options. Um, so are visitors to your city facilities welcomed if they come by some mode other than driving? Like today, for instance, not to brag on this very nice location, these doors are not open. If you get off the train, you have to walk to the parking lot and come in through the parking lot. Same is true where I work, which uh, is at the Raymond Station. But it's an orientation, you know? It does say something that the train people have to walk to the other end. but. In this case, this is a this is a map from a, a Green Step City. Biking is a fun activity, but carries significant risk of personal injury. Oh, nice. yeah. <laughs> right below the bike map, um, cars can carry significant risk of <laughs> personal injury. I mean, but on the other hand, I kind of see the point that if you're the only cyclist out there in a six-lane crossing, you are at some significant risk. If the cars are or if bicycle odd an activity that you're seen as some kind of strange outlier. <coughs> but cities in your practices and in, and in recognizing those who are doing this, who are biking, can start to normalize that activity um, and start to say, yes, it is safe, or to help tell people where are the safer routes. And that goes back to you know, putting on your website directions that would accommodate all modes. If there is a transit stop that's near your city hall, is it, if you tell people on your website, you could take the Apple Valley Transit Station two or five or six block walk to city hall. Um, is there a bike route nearby? Is there to ride your bike? Is there bike parking uh, there? Uh, another one practices is to try to, when possible, if you're doing city events that are off-site, and again, you're going to be in different places. I realize this is not necessarily a factor for every city that's, that's in the group, but to the extent that you are able to choose a location that is accessible by bike, say you're having and there's a bike path coming to it, just note that. Tell people you could get here by bike as well as by driving, and you start to normalize the activity. Um, so do your do your staff currently ride bikes, walk, take transit, or carpool? Um, these are a couple of graphics from the Met Council Travel Behavior Inventory. This this is people who take the region, the seven county metro region. 52% of them are in the urban areas, but 31% are in the developed suburb, and 16% are in the developing suburbs. So there are transit riders beyond the core cities. Um, they're out there. Um, so one thing that cities could do is to include multimodal information in new hire orientations. Um, 
looking at who's on staff that is using these different modes, create a buddy system or see if those employees would be resources for other new employees or existing employees about how did I get here? What's the what's the deal? Carpooling, which I'll get to in a sec, is also something that um, a buddy system or a more uh, could also do. <coughs> on the second level of, of um, green stuff actions, compensating for modes other than driving alone. Um, there's a lot of things that people do for this. This can range from travel during the day to compensating for the commute. Um, there are pre-tax uh, benefits for taking transit, uh, for parking, for van pools, and for bicycles. Um, they have to, there are rules around those things. You kind of have to hook up with your uh, HR person or if you have a benefits administrator. Um, there are things to know about that, but it is possible to compensate. And some organizations go so far as to actually add compensation for multimodal commute. So um, where I work and I know at, at Fresh Energy, which is another um, transportation leader, we have timesheets. And so we check off on our timesheet the days that we take the bus or ride the bike or walk to work or carpool. And we get $3 for that on the, on, for the days that we do that added to our, our payment. Because we're not um, using resource, you know, it's a kind of a value of the company. But, um, but on the, the other thing that to keep in mind about it is that um, if you're providing Really great that you today. Then free parking. You know, in free parking, uh, the average parking lot costs five thousand dollars of space to build. It. Now, whether you built it yourself or someone else did, it's a sunk cost. And so everybody that drives their car has everything nicely set up for them. Um, but if you have the ability to um, to sort of communicate that to people, you know, because it does take a little education to flip that can be a good thing. I'm going to go back to carpooling. When we did the surveys within the, um, the organizations and transportation leaders, carpooling came up as one of the more consistent activities. Um, it's right up there for all organizations. Uh, kind of a surprise to me, I didn't expect it. Um, but especially as you get beyond the uh, course, um, it can be one of the ways that people can figure out a way to give up a car or can um, reduce their emissions and things like that. There are lots of robust ride uh, share mapping tools. Metro Transit has one. Um, there's also this, we have another program where I work where we try to help people access jobs. And I was talking to a um, community development manager at one of the cities, and he said, you know, when he's looking at new coming to town, so the two things that do come up, he says, is that, that new employers want, that they're, they're more focused on these transportation options than they were in the past. So he's aware of that now when he's looking at sort of the area that he has to work with. He knows where there's better options and where there are not. But he also said the other problem is employers of a uh, either more industrial or working class or minimum wage, they have a problem sometimes getting people to work. You know, they have jobs that people can't get to them. So one of the things that we've worked with with employee with individuals to do, not so much with employers at this point, is to try to um, Look at carpooling to transit. Uh, I was working with a um, landscape person out in uh, business out in uh, Medina. And he said, you know, we have the job, but we cannot get people out there. And so did a little research and figured out that the nearest park and ride to their work is in Wyzetta. And it's still a 10-mile bike ride right. from there where their business is. If they looked on 
their staff, could they find anyone who was willing to carpool to the transit stop? Because that Wyzetta Park and Ride has frequent service, uh, frequent enough in the morning and the afternoon. You could get employers out to there. And then is there some way that the employer can work on that last 10 miles? Either by providing some space and reward to someone who does decide they're going to try to bike that, because there are some routes that you could do it, or by kind of figuring out whether there's some sort of a carpool situation, or, you know, they have landscaping trucks that are going out because they make one of their first stops at that transit center to pick up workers. <clears throat> so you got to be a little creative about this, but it's a, it's, a, um, it's a need that people have. So carpooling is probably thing um, from a green point of view. Um, on the benefits side, I mentioned before pre-tax pre and direct payments, but wellness programs are another way that you can build this stuff in. Um, this is Rubenna Cooley from Lutheran Social Service. Uh, they changed their wellness program to include um, points for multimodal commutes. Um, the University of Minnesota is probably uh, setting the standard in doing this. They have the ZAP system. Does anybody know what that is? Um, Peter does. A uh, few people do. So when, if you ride by one on your bike because it's beep, and uh, they they are able to track because of that people that, and they actually even linked it up with the nice ride so that if you if you do nice ride it also counts. But if you Riding the bike earns a certain number of points. It doesn't get you the whole way toward the, um, what the insurance policy wants in terms of points, but it gets you a good distance, like half the points if you ride your bike at least six times a month or something like that. Um, then you get $400 off on your health care. Talking about employees and um, what's out there, you know, this may not be possible for everybody, but just to know that it's out there and to be able to kind of look at it as, is it an option for you? Um, these are some of the things that, um, you know, I said, if you're going to ride your bike to work, well does the, the location sort of acknowledge that, say, yeah, we're happy that you're doing that. At Poly Bicycle Products is into this, clearly, they're a bicycle company, but they're located in Bloomington, which is, you know, not terrible for transit. That's some pretty good stuff, but I don't think they're on a transit line. So they're, bless you, bless you. Um, they have indoor bike parking. They have a shower and towel service for bike commuters. They have a locker room. Um, they have a bike and helmet purchase benefit. They organize social bike rides. They do things like this. And, and recently I was on a webinar with an employer in Duluth that's doing the same thing, um, where they have um, they looked at this one in Duluth was really pretty cool. It, it had somebody on staff who knew GPS, and they they took their location, which was not so not right in downtown Duluth, but it was sort of close. And they did a radius map: um, a half a mile, a mile, two miles, three miles. You know, and, and the the walk distance is obviously a half a mile to a mile is pretty easy walk. Biking gets you out easily three miles. It's a very short biking distance, and the, the Bent Paddle Brewery was on their, <laughs> their destination. So after work, you can swing by Bent Paddle. But they also had other facilities that their staff go to regularly. And they created that map and said, these are places that are nearby, and you could bike to them. You could, you could walk to these ones that are nearer. Um, at our place, uh, we have been in negotiation with our landlord about having a shower, but we did create a changing room, uh, which is a it's just another cube, basically. We put a door on a cube, and uh, this is a space where you can hang your clothes um, during the day. If it's hot when you get to work riding your bike, you may need a place to put your clothes so they can dry out during the day. So that's um, indoor bike parking. Just kind of fun. Uh, so what about trips during the day? I mentioned that radius. Nearby destinations travel during during facilities. I knew that uh, City of Big Lake is here. Who was that? There you go. Um, so I I just I don't even know if this is possible. This is what I'm <laughs> but you know your city hall is here and the Big Lake station and platform is there. It's about a mile. It'd be 20 minutes. So 
to walk there. Um, and there could be other destinations. I think I did another one, uh, Hastings City Hall and Hastings Administration Center. I don't know whether those are frequent destinations within Hastings back and forth, but that's about a mile to 21 minute thing. Now, if you have to go there and then 100 other places that day, you might need to drive. But if you're just going there and back, I don't even know if that's a pleasant walk. But, um, but getting that little bit of a walk into the day can do a lot. I didn't think all the health benefits of getting outside of how much people who walk or bike to work arrive with, you know, way more verve than people who drove. There's all kinds of health benefits. But getting a walk in the middle of the day can do that. You know, it can just be a really great way to think and get a break. But does the city, does do your policy say that's cool with us or encourage it? And so that's what we're trying to think about today is are there destinations that are near enough to your where your employees work? Um, I also plotted a diner, but I didn't put it up here, but I was trying to figure out whether there was a way to bike between public works and the Adina City Hall. And I yeah, maybe, maybe not, right? Yeah, you can do it, but it would just would take a while. <laughs> yeah. You know, and it could be I was talking to um one of my coworkers who's who used to do this this kind of work and he said, you know, if it takes a while, it might not be from your boss's point of view the best use of time. They might say, No, I'm not gonna pay you to go ride your bike for forty minutes to get to this other destination. But the flip side of that is that you might be underestimating the amount of time it would take you to drive and to park. Um, not in every case, but it's a conversation worth having about when it might be appropriate or when you might intentionally do that as a half team building activity or something like that. So for trips during the day, um, educate city council members and staff. Look at what these options might be. Um, Create a staff, staff transportation committee to organize these kinds of regular things. Organize employee learning activities. These are all part of the new um, new actions that are in there. Um, so then city facilities, we looked at this a little bit, but is there parking for other modes? Um, and what you can do is install or expand bike parking and provide preferential parking for electric vehicles carpools and van pools. Um, if there are people on your staff who are getting around in these ways, giving them some priority, this is interesting, you know, it's easy potentially to do this and it's a way to take one step um, towards signaling that these kinds of options are important. Um, I also heard recently that the, the University of Minnesota um, opened a bike center uh, a few years ago and they put in sheltered bar bike parking. They took, they were in a ramp, um, a parking ramp near your uh, facility. Anybody have those? There's parking lot. Sounds like lot. You, they took um, parking spaces within a ramp and converted them into sheltered, covered, secure bike parking. You, you use your University of Minnesota uh, key to get in there and they had to expand it but the thing that was fascinating to me is they took like 13 let's even say 20 car parking spaces and they got 220 bike parking spaces that I get the numbers um, I'll have to check them for you with Steve Sanders but it was less than 20 car spaces converted into more than 200 by using two story That was pretty stiff, but, <laughs> but options there. One thing to know about bike parking is you always want to put it in a um, busy place. Don't put it back around the corner. Put it right out front. Um, partly a signal of that option. Much less like bike parking is, is right out front. Um, this is the travel log survey that I talked about. Um, it's pretty easy to do, and from it, we were able to four the transportation leader organizations. All these bars are the non 
And then within it, there's transit is orange, carpool is blue, water is light green, but the share in some cases was pretty significant. And, and I it doesn't have that many employees, but, um, but you, you would, by doing this survey, that, that if you, I'll talk about in a minute with how you could get that, you would have a sense of how your employees are getting around. Um, uh, so, in general, this is just a push to um, hopefully some of these ideas have, have sparked a thought about how you could be more multimodal, um, being adaptable, independent, getting where you need to go by knowing your options, and depending on combination. Typically, it is a combination. Typically, it's not an all or nothing proposition. It's a mix it in, do it when it works kind of proposition. But as employers, you can make space for that. Um, one thing I didn't talk about uh, earlier about uh, flexible workplace policies, which is another piece of the, um, the new actions, is, um, is to make the time, I think I did mention it, but um, to be able to welcome people when they're a little bit late or to kind of know that if that their bus might come in at 10 minutes past the hour as opposed to 8 o'clock on the bus. Um, so I'll talk about this a little bit more later, but if, if any of these have sparked um, a thought and you want to go deeper about this, um, we are offering a, um, a follow-up workshop where we can come to your city um, and do some kind of a training. We can dig in on some of these different options like carpooling, like uh, what the benefits might look like, what are the options where you are. Um, and we bring in uh, the people who are experts on this, this is what we did in the last workshop. Who would be interested in this? Um, we have found that it always helps to have someone in the room who already cares about these options um, and who is maybe familiar with using some of them. Human resources, economic development, and public work staff. I talked to one city that uh, was talking about doing its meetings about new projects and uh, actually won an award for instead of doing a public meet, you know, a sort of community meeting about a new treatment of a road at 7 p.m. at the community center, that they came up with the idea of just shutting down that road. <laughs> that they did it as like a block party on a particular day and said, we're going to look at how this thing works. And so, you know, they had to have a backup plan for if it rains and things like that. But it was a great new way to bring people who would not normally come into a, um, a public work uh, meeting into that. So, like I said before, you know, doing it at a time of day with child care, but also promoting the option. But, um, that is what I have now. Um, I'm going to be turning it over to Shelly. I have a few minutes if there's any questions right off the bat. Diana? <clears throat> so I heard you offer a workshop to the cities. I'm curious if they do that and they get some, you know, kind of better information and for their own operations. Only two or can you host a workshop for them to invite their nonprofit organizations to to learn more about how they since you guys did this work, um, how those nonprofits can do. Because one of the things that we really encourage at Green Tip Cities is what can they do to um, promote sustainability in their oh, yeah. community? Right. I think that would be an option. And it could be nonprofit or for profit. Um, if they had, if the city wanted to do, basically, this this um, offer for a workshop is a kind of limited in the sense that we don't have a ton of capacity to do a bunch of them. Mm -hmm. But, um, but it can be designed in a way that works for the city. For what, so whether it's for city staff or whether it's for city staff and some local business owners or nonprofits or educational institutions, um, figuring out who's in the room right. can be up to the, the city. Thank you. Any other questions? So another um, question would be related to city. Uh, we started to work on climate action plans and. It's easy to understand how 
energy and electricity reduce carbon, but also land use and um, transit-oriented development. Uh, do you know of other resources of how to quantify the carbon benefits of switching to transit? Yeah, there's some. I don't have the graph on here, but the um, non-motorized transportation pilot by Twin Cities was part of a federal program, and they did calculate the USDOT calculated the um, so with a 78% increase in bicycling, um, they looked at what that meant in terms of gallons of gas not used, miles not driven. Um, so there was a direct correlation. And that that's in the if you okay. Google in TPP. Okay. Um, there's a 2014 report to Congress about the whole pilot program, and I believe that data is in there. Um, so that's your resource for that. Yeah. Good question for you. Great presentation. Um, so the city of Delta Heights recently received a grant from the University of Minnesota for three six stations. Okay. So we're going to put. One at City Hall, one at our park, and one. And these are just standalone stations where you can put in your bike, secure it, and then it has tools or hooking bike that are attached to cables. <laughs> Go anywhere, hopefully. Um, but I'm wondering is that a effective best practice that you would recommend? Are these Use? Yeah, that's an interesting question. Um, I think uh, I don't have any data about that, but intuitively having the ability to fix a flat or pump a tire um, is really kind of key. And I know that um, Bike Fix Station, if that's the name, they have set up some kinds of sites like that at transit platforms. So there are certain ones in the metro that have these. Uh, like vending machines, or no, maybe they're fixed stations just like you're talking about, but also Pedal Minnesota, which is an initiative through the um, Departments of Health and Transportation, I think, has set some of those up, and there's one on the Midtown Greenway. Um, and so they would probably have some more uh, input about where it has shown up. So, but I think, again, it's another pretty definite signal that you're saying this is an important way of getting around. We're going to try to anticipate um, what's up there. The other thing that uh, I saw recently is that if you're a member of AAA, AAA now um, will come rescue you on your bike. Oh, Not just for your car. You can call them and say, my bike, you know, I have a flat or whatever. And they'll <coughs> um, so I think kind of mixing the multimodal in is becoming a more normative idea. <coughs> Anything else for the moment? Otherwise, we'll. Oh, wait, Philip. Well, you know, I, I was just thinking of uh, work that was done. Uh, the PCA um, hired over a number of years uh, a social psychologist to <coughs> sort of look at um, how do people change their behavior or sort of rethink how they're doing things. And this concept of norms, like other people are doing it, everyone is doing it, many people are doing it. Uh, is is one of those very powerful, as opposed to saying, um, you know, other messages which may be more abstruse or technical. It's sort of, I mean, it's a very squishy sort of everyone's doing. It. It's no, it's normal. It's it's, uh, it's more powerful than I think we would all imagine uh, because no one, or most people, I think that's what it shows that people just we don't want to be most people don't want to be outliers. I mean, I'm sure. Yeah, that's true. <clears throat> so, the, so you, when you talk about norms, it turns out it's, it's in the in the literature it's much more significant uh, study more than uh, I ever. That's good to hear. Well, I think it is possible to to see if there are some steps, even small ones, that can start to say that it's normative. It's okay to do this. So I'm hoping that's what's percolating in your. Have Shelley now talk about what it was like for the Council of Nonprofits to kind of dig into these issues. Thank you. Thanks, Hillary. Uh, so thank you um, for having me here today. Um, so I will be talking uh, briefly about our organization's journey to becoming a certified 
transit leader and some of the actions that we've taken um, along the way and some of the challenges and benefits that we've seen. Uh, and we still have some actions to take, certainly. So, um, so just briefly a little bit about the Minnesota Council of Nonprofits. I know some of you are familiar with our organization. We're an association, much like the League. Um, our members are nonprofit organizations. Um, our mission is to inform, promote, connect, and strengthen in the nonprofit sector. Um, so we are the professional trade association for Minnesota's nonprofits. We're kind of the <coughs> chamber of nonprofits, or chamber of commerce for nonprofits, I guess, for lack of a better description. Um, and much like a chamber, we provide some of the similar types of uh, services. So um, we do service discounts on you know, things that nonprofits need to buy, like payroll services or benefits. Um, we do a number of publications. A big part of our work is trainings and conferences. Um, so we do seven large conferences each year and over 100 trainings. Um, research and kind of trend tracking that 30,000 foot view of what's happening in the sector. Uh, public policy and best practices, which um, will come into play and we'll talk a little bit about that as well. Um, but so in terms of our journey, um, you know, as Hillary talked about this already, we've had a partnership with Transit for Livable Communities for the last, I think, about year and a half. Um, one of the first things that uh, we did is with TLC, as Hillary mentioned, is we did a survey uh, of our nonprofit members to assess their transportation habits. Um, and I'll just mention a couple of interesting things since I was grateful to receive the results of those. We had over 1,300 respondents, which was great. Um, we found that over 50% of our respondents live within 10 miles of work. And so this is kind of that issue that we talked about. There's more uh, modes available. Um, it makes it really easier to have different kinds of modes of transit when you have a lot of options. Um, almost 30% uh, of nonprofits employees get to work in other ways than driving alone, so people are using different methods. Um, and another interesting statistic that came out of the survey was that 30% um, have tried other uh, non-traditional options like car sharing, um, which is a way to get to work, which hopefully shows that people are option to, open to trying different options. Um, in addition, uh, Transit for Liberal Communities offered uh, several in-person workshops that that Hillary talked about, um, and we were uh, able to connect at least one other nonprofit with uh, with Transit for Local Communities to do another similar workshop for their members. Um, and then we also uh, surveyed our own members and staff. We talked about that too. Uh, to t and then I'll talk a little bit about what we found out from that, the benefits and challenges um, with our staff as well. Uh, and then we did sign ourselves up to participate in this certificate program. Uh, we strove for the highest, the max uh, certification. Um, and then those groups that did uh, attain certification were recognized at the MPN Annual Conference last October. Um, we also had a pre existing effort. So we had a green, a green team, is what we call it. Um, so it's a group of, and it was started by some, in, some folks in our organization, but we've um, since drawn tenants of our landlords who work for nonprofits. So we're lucky to have a landlord on in the uh, Midway area who works with a lot of nonprofit organizations. And we just kind of reached out to other nonprofits in those buildings and said, hey, we're doing this green team. You want to be a part of this effort? And um, it's mostly about sustainable workplace practices. And obviously, transit is a big um, part of that. So we were already doing some of that work, um, which was great. And then just personal interest on staff, including myself, who had uh, a personal interest in this topic. and. Um, I took the workshop and I got to see all the folks come in and um, someone showed us an electric car and you know it might seem like well you know that's pretty simple stuff and I know about the bus and the light rail but you know not everybody probably had been on you know seen an electric car and the charger and you know how it works and where they have to figure out to plug it in and you know to take the light rail um, we learned about the zap um, at the U of M um, and the best part is we all got to go on a nice ride. And um, we actually, in our location, which is um, close to University in Raymond, there's a nice ride station right across the street. And um, you know, I know some of our staff have been on those bikes, but I had never been on a nice ride bike. And I got there and figured out how it works. And I got my helmet. And I keep my helmet at work in case anybody wants to use it. Um, so it was a lot of fun, and it was just a really great way to have a hands-on experience with a lot of those options. So, and I think for the other participants as well, it was just 
it was just a great experience to be able to do that. Um, so I mentioned that we had some um, actions already in place. And so um, one thing that we try to do is we try to have our events at locations that are transit friendly. I mentioned we do a lot of conferences. One year we, um, we have a partnership with the University of Minnesota for our leadership conference. And every year we usually hold it at the McNamara Alumni Center, which is just down university. Uh, by the stadium, but one year we had it at the Arboretum in Chanhassen, and we heard a lot from a lot of people that it's not transit friendly, and, and some people had to, you know, were calling us for, can you help us arrange carpools to get there? So that was a really good lesson for us in terms of holding events um, at transit friendly locations. We actually adopted a policy. We have a, um, an inclusive and accessible events policy, and it started out um, from, with different issues. So it started out more around issues of religious inclusion, um, but we since adapted it to make it more um, accessible for folks with disabilities. Um, and then Hillary recently gave us some feedback on making it more transit friendly, so we'll be incorporating that as well. Uh, Hillary talked about having staff champions. So I, while I have a great interest in this topic, we actually have a couple other folks who are way more interested. They're very involved in our green team. Um, they're avid bicyclists, they bike in the winter, um, and they've been the ones saying like, you know, oh, we need to figure out where to put our bikes in the winter because there's no good place in our building right now. And, you know, I'm just going to put it in the basement and hopefully the landlord will get the picture. But that actually has helped us start conversations uh, with their landlord who kind of said, you know, people are kind of sticking their bikes in the basement and what's going on with that? Well, they don't have a place to park it. So it's really helped us start those conversations. Um, we talked about, I talked about this uh, green team that we have um, and also the bike racks. I, I actually put some pictures. So my, my colleague who's one of our staff champions, I found out she's been taking pictures of the bike racks once a month. Um, and so she can <laughs> tell our landlords, like, here, here's one of our bike racks. This is the only bike rack we have, I believe, in our building. And as Hillary can tell you what she said about having it close to the front, it's not close to the front. It's around the back. And actually, the light rail stop, we we're actually lucky to be on the Raymond Station light rail stop uh, and like three, I think three bus lines. Um, but the, the bike parking is around the back of the building, so if you didn't know it was there, you probably wouldn't be able to find it unless you know, it was there. Uh, but it's full all the time in the summer. People are putting their bikes on the um, stairs and on signs. And in the winter, we have tons of bikes um, as well. So there's definitely a need. Um, we have a flexible dress policy, uh, so kind of a dress for the day. That's something we've always done. Um, have a lot of an external um, meeting, but we also have days where we're just in the office doing research or, you know, writing emails or putting together meetings. Um, so we're we're perfectly fine with that, uh, and we do know that people do take bikes um, or you know come in and talk to us. Um, we, for a long time, we've offered a, a, a flex plan pre-tax transit benefit, which, oddly enough, for a long time, the only person who was using it was somebody in Duluth. So um, I thought that was great that, that she was using the bus system up there. Um, so some of the things in progress are recently completed. Um, uh, as I mentioned, I attended the transit leadership workshop. Um, we did a staff and member survey, and so we uh, our the whole membership, as I had mentioned, uh, in 2014, and then we also surveyed our own staff in the summer and then the fall again in 2015. Um, and then again, that was really helpful because it, you know, like we were talking about, it it helps you assess where people are really at right now. What is their starting point, and what are some of the areas of concern? Where can you kind of help meet people halfway in terms of maybe the reasons they might not be using transit? Um, we. Just a very super easy thing we did is we added bus lines to our website. Um, one of the great things about the certification program for us is, you know, Hillary called me and said, you know, here's a couple of really easy things you can do. So able to kind of audit your policies, your kind of more visible things um, was really helpful. And that took like all of, um, as I mentioned, we're going to be incorporating Hillary's comments in our accessible event policy. Um, one of the most exciting things that we've been doing is our, our green team's been taking off and uh, to coincide with Minneapolis um, the Bike Week uh, next week, uh, we are putting together our own bike walk transit uh, challenge. And so we've got a number of activities planned. The biggest one is we're doing a commuter challenge. Um, so that will, that involves dividing into teams and apparently almost all of our staff have signed up, which is awesome. 
Um, and so the teams are going to record their cues. And unfortunately, we didn't include this into our um, health insurance, but if we can do this consistently enough, maybe that's something we can negotiate. But um, so recording to me is giving points for distance travel, so either biking or walking. Um, and maybe transit, I'm not sure, I'm not the one who organized this, but also time travel. And so um, the person who put together is, this, is a policy analyst, so she's doing some kind of weighted averages, and, <laughs> you know, a, a very technical way to make sure it's very fair. Um, it's all on the honor system, and so it includes morning and evening commutes, um, and then the days you're out of the office, those don't help you. Um, but it's all, yeah, morning, evening commutes, and work-related travel during the day. And then we'll be giving prizes out at a social hour um, at a walking distance location from our office. So we'll be at the Urban Growler, um, you can easily bike or walk there. And it's meant to be fun. And I think that's part of what's really helped us get participation is it's just going to be a really fun uh, con contest. There's also, we'll be walking to our local co-op, the Hampton Park Co-op, for lunch that week. Um, and then we did attempt a nice drive bike demo, but we've had trouble getting a hold of them. I should probably connect with you more on that because we have been trying to do that for the last couple of years. Uh, maybe we just have the wrong person, but um, as I had mentioned, we've got so it's super easy, and we've had a lot of interest in that. We also last year. Um, um, so we have a landlord, and probably unlike most of you own your facilities, but that's been a big. Uh, part of what we're doing right now um, in terms of advancing some of these issues forward. So we're currently renewing our lease, um, expanding our space within our building, and so um, the bike rack issue is front and center on our list of negotiations. And we actually worked with our landlord to try to get a grant from a local community foundation for more bike racks. And unfortunately, the grant wasn't approved, but it's still something uh, we're working on, and they were actually willing to, to go in together with us on that grant. So we're very excited about that potential for that partnership. Um, we're adding several private spaces, including a wellness room, which hopefully we can incorporate into a changing room as well. Um, and then the showers has been on our list for a while. We know we've got rust and plumbing in our basement, so we're also trying to figure out how to get that on the list. Um, the, the big thing with our space expansion is we'll be expanding our current conference room into a large training space. And our landlord has also said that parking is a huge concern um, for them because we're on you know, we're very close to Raymond and University, and so we've got a surface lot. Um, but we have talked about doing incentivizing our participants for non-car travel. Um, so, you know, we've talked about either vouchers or discounts off the workshop, or vouchers for a neighborhood business, a local business. Um, we've got a couple of coffee shops in the area, locally owned businesses, um, to people who show a transit pass, a bike helmet, or maybe like a Google Maps for walking. And I'm sure there's other things we can do, and I'm sure Hillary has some good ideas too. <laughs> maybe I'll connect with you on that too. Um, looking forward, we've got um, definitely got some more things on our list. Um, we have not yet, but we've talked about looking into memberships and some of the uh, car services. We've got, I, I think there's probably four or five car to go that are parked around our building and some of the lo other local buildings on a regular basis. Um, we do compensate. So today I took the light rail, that my work will pay for that, that's no problem. We have staff to go to the Capitol a lot um, during the legislative session. You know, when staff go to a workshop, we you know, compensate for that because we do pay for parking, but we need to be more consistent. So we're hoping to put together some more of a um, Better on-site amenities. So we talked about the showers and the bike racks, and in particular, the winter bike parking um, has been uh, a pain point um, in our building. And then just ongoing group activities. So our green team tends to be pretty active in the summer and spring and fall, but not as active in the winter. So it's, it's a little cyclical, but I think if we can be a bit more consistent um, and draw people in on a more regular basis, we can achieve some of those you know, other goals. Um, just get people more comfortable with those activities. So just a few more words um, about some of the best practices and, and kind of benefits and challenges that we've seen. Um, so one of the benefits of um, working from our perspective as an association of nonprofits is that we have access to a large audience. And so we've certainly been um, very uh, successful in promoting um, the certification program to our members. Um, and we have, you know, 2,100 nonprofits. We communicate in a few to many style formats. We are able to do a lot of, you know, big email blasts and ways um, to reach other organizations. Um, we have access to a local cohort of like-minded nonprofits in our building, and so that's been a big key uh, to making some of our practices work so far. 
Um, so one thing that we have um, as a nonprofit, we publish um, the principles and practices for nonprofit excellence. Some of you might be familiar with these. Um, there are 11 overarching principles and 192, can't do probably all in one <laughs> sitting, management practices. Um, and Transit for Livable Communities included, I think it was like four or five of these best practices in their certification program and talked about how um, you can apply, these practices apply to transit. So, you know, multimodal transit helps with things like providing adequate benefits to staff and helping encourage workplace diversity, um, helping allocate resources to volunteers, promoting a positive work environment, which is all enhanced by support of the promotion of multimodal transit. Um, and then the last thing uh, in terms of benefits is we've definitely noticed, and I saw this in, in Hillary's slide too, is I've noticed that more anecdotally are not using cars to get around and the cost of college, you know, that, that example that you gave of the cost of a car of the $9,000 per year, um, I'm sure, you know, a lot of millennials are dealing with these huge student loans um, and other issues, you know, just that it's easier to take to millennial hires are not driving and they do our orientation. That's a background check, um, and they're all like, no, well, I don't drive, so <laughs> it doesn't apply to me. I'm like, wow, something is happening here, <laughs> definitely. <laughs> um, and just, uh, you know, in terms of challenges, the biggest challenge is a statewide organization. So we're, we cover the whole state of Minnesota, and we did um, in our staff survey, and I'm sure all, um, in greater Minnesota, non-car transit is harder to come by, for sure. Um, our geographic, our regional coordinators co cover a really large geographic so that certainly is a challenge, but they can also work from home, and so they do. They work from home a lot. They keep office hours because they need to have a public place where they can connect with our members in that region, um, but a lot of their work is from home. Um, and then when we, as a staff, drive from St. Paul, we have a, a board retreat every year in Greater Minnesota. We take all of our board members. We don't reimburse for their travel if they don't carpool with us. So we take usually almost all of our Metro board members in like three minivans. We pack ourselves in and we do carpool um, to those locations. Um, weather, you know, has been a challenge. When I looked at the survey results, um, we found that a lot of people are not uh, taking transit because of the cold and rain. Although some people actually said it was a choice between well, I didn't bike today, so I took the train or I took the bus. So that was encouraging to see. Um, and then safety. So there were definitely some comments about, like, you know, Raymond Avenue and or I don't bike in St. Paul because it's not safe. But it kind of gets to the issue of meeting people where they are. So figuring out what their concerns are. And if people have concerns like that, hooking them up with somebody else who can help them find a different route um, or just help alleviate some of those concerns with different, you know, selective um, type here um, or just maybe some other kinds of suggestions. But um, so that's, that's what we've done and what we've seen. It's been a lot of fun, and um, Transit for Livable Communities has been a great resource for the nonprofit sector. So we really appreciate the partnership. Questions? Anyone questions? Done. Uh, you guys have somebody at the state capitol, too. Are they keeping an eye on the transportation funding bill? Yes, I'm not a policy. I'm, I'm like I'm not a policy person at okay, all. Right. Yes, but if you if you're curious about that, I can certainly connect you with our policy. Yeah. Okay. So we can exchange cards. For sure. From the human resources point of view, the Hillary Medical System and uh, electronic timesheet. Is it? I'm wondering whether standard software packages where the staff would uh, log, you know, hours work, time vacation, whatever, whether adding a sort of checkoff or how did you get to work, I wonder if that's a really difficult thing, whether, whether uh, software packages are, human resources were alert, flexible enough to add, I, it never quite occurred to me, either because I thought about organizations uh, doing a certain couple of times a year doing a survey of how on average you get to work, but Obviously, much easier if people do have timesheets to just check, you know, like, you know. Yeah, we don't use those. I've looked at a couple of time tracking. We um, we don't have use electronic time cards, but we're trying to move our like 
pay time off to, to tracking and it does look like most of them are flexible enough that you can enter you know various things and you can enter your own benefits because people have different benefits like you know we have paid parental leave so that would be something not everybody would have but we can enter that as a benefit they do seem very customizable do they? Okay. Um, yeah I think it would depend on the package but you know they're trying to win customers so I think flexibility is always key. Okay. Yeah. yeah that'd be great to see the other organization does deal with one of those organizations benefit companies. And she said that um, they know, you know, the, the adaptability of their system for putting in different modes, but they don't know what those are and how you might integrate them into your work between the technology system administrative aspect, but then the know-how on the ground. Kind of, you have to kind of bring that to it. Yeah. Question. So I'm just curious, so you, you guys are obviously doing a bunch of really great things with incentivizing these things, but it's still, you, you still made the comment that the land grant is concerned about parking and is concerned about all these things that we kind of look at standard. And I'm just curious if you think there's ever going to be a point where these incentives are not going to be enough and we're actually going to have to go on the other side and say, well, let's see if we can discourage driving because that's the other side of the equation that nobody really talks about. Mm -hmm. And I'm curious if you had any conversations about that where, yes, you can do incentivizing these other modes which, are, which have these added benefits, but also at the same time, we need to look at the other side of the equation. Yeah, we haven't yet, but we should because midway parking is really it's tough and it's getting worse. <laughs> so, yeah, no, it, it's something we need to Thank you for that comment. There, there are some employers, this comes up more in downtown, yeah. um, where they cash out. And one of the transportation leader organizations is moving, and it's going to do that when it moves to the new building. So instead of providing any free parking, they're going to provide every employee a certain amount per month. <coughs> and they can do with it what they want. Sure. And they can use it to pay for parking. It won't pay for the total cost of downtown parking. But they can also use it to buy stuff for their bike, <coughs> to pay for the transit pass. It's, um, it's going to be a self-administered amount of money for every employee. Yeah. Yeah. Are you looking for me to get back to the interview? Oh. Thanks, Jelly. Thanks. Mm -hmm. Thanks. Well, you know what? I'm happy to do it if you want me to. Because <laughs> this is my old friend, Will. <laughs> Hi, it's me again. Um, so I really want to thank Shelly. Um, uh, Shelly and I go way back into our way, early, way back. early 20s. We worked together at an organization long, long ago. So it was great to surprise to see her on the agenda. And um, welcoming another friend, um, Will Delaney from Hope Communities. Uh, we've worked together um, for quite a while with Metro Sturt and working with their properties to help educate um, residents um, with energy efficiency, um, all kinds of different things. A member of our steering committee is very active um, in the work that they do. So, uh, And we are not far in geography from our office, so really excited to have Will here, another surprise for me this morning. So Will Delaney from Hope Community. <laughs> Thank you, thank you. Um, so I, my presentation, I think, will be a little bit different as, uh, as Hillary talked about. I'm, I'll talk a little bit about our experience as, as a trans, transportation leader uh, through that program, but also really about um, a, a recent real estate project we did, which is really kind of wrapped up into Hope's entire story. So I, I figured it'd be easier just to start with that. Um, hope, hopefully it's applicable. Uh, we are a uh, Hope community. We are a nonprofit uh, community development corporation uh, in the Phillips community in South Minneapolis. Uh, folks are familiar with Minneapolis. Um, uh, we are just south of downtown, right about where 94 and 35 come together uh, at the intersection of Franklin and Portland. Um, started uh, 40 years ago, a Catholic nuns, a couple of sisters of St. Joseph. Um, <laughs> the culture stuff everybody else is talking about, you know, dress for the work day, flexible stuff, and grand door culture. So we, we didn't have to worry about any of that stuff. Um, but, um, we uh, we are a nonprofit um, really focuses on um, building a community uh, in, in a place that for many many years um, was completely marked by a lack of 
by um, uh, just kind of being the product of, of decades of either intentional um, harm by uh, you know poor investment from governments, um, uh, the, the white flight suburban sprawl that happened through a lot of central city neighborhoods across the country uh, in the 50s, 60s, 70s. Um, that's kind of the setting of where we landed. But um, uh, to give you a, a visual sense, this is the corner of Franklin and Portland Avenues in South Minneapolis, mid 1990s. Uh, at the time, uh, four as again, you know, a mile from downtown Minneapolis. If you think about now what real estate is doing in Minneapolis, uh, the rents that the landlords are getting for their properties, it's kind of incredible this is just sitting there. Uh, so we were uh, on Portland Avenue, just about a half block away uh, from that corner. For years, folks' work had been about uh, working with the people in, in that community. So uh, largely, so Phil's community just, again, is one of the most diverse uh, neighborhoods in the state. Uh, it's a, something like 25% Latino, 25% slash African American, which includes a large uh, East African population. Uh, it's got the largest urban American Indian population uh, in the country, uh, largely in the, you know, the eastern part of Phillips around the Little Earth community. Um, it is incredibly diverse. Um, it has, for over 100 years, kind of been the landing place for new arrivals. It's uh, no uh, surprise that the American Swedish Institute is in the Phillips neighborhood, that Norway House, the new Norwegian cultural center, is in the Phillips neighborhood, because that's where those communities got their start. Uh, and so same thing uh, through the generations. In the 60s, it was African Americans coming from the South, uh, urban or you know American Indians coming into the city. Um, more recently, Latino immigrants, uh, as well as East African immigrants, um, particularly Somali, uh, into our neighborhood. So um, it's always been a place where people have come to find opportunity, again, being a mile from downtown. But with that lack of investment, folks work um, really had to, had to shift. In the early days, we were a shelter for women and children. Uh, by the mid-1990s, if you look at kind of this just real lack of investment, Hope uh, made the decision to change its mission to really be about community revitalization, community development, and not just kind of, oh, we want this to be a better place, so let's invest a ton in real estate uh, that's going to you know, drive up rents and really bring the market up here. It was really an intentional strategy around how do we develop through an alternative to gentrification. Um, uh, Hope's early work included a lot of listening, and we still do a lot of our work through listening and engaging with people in the neighborhood. Um, what we heard in the in the early and mid 1990s, uh, when talking to people about you know about their neighborhood, what they thought of their neighborhood, what they thought other people thought about their neighborhood, and what they thought about was likely to happen to their neighborhood in the future, what people often said was something along the lines of. You know, we love this neighborhood, we, we would like it to get better, we think it will get better eventually, but it probably won't be for people like us, it'll probably be for people with money. Um, and so, um, so that was really for, uh, foundational in Hope's approach to the real estate work that we've taken on over the past 20, 20 or so years. Um, moving forward, uh, so this is just some background on the Phillips neighborhood, you know, pick up a newspaper, bad headlines, Murderapolis I think was the headline. Uh, you know, kind of uh, coined uh, about Phillips back in the day. Um, as, as I mentioned, you know, kind of predominantly people of color, predominantly low and moderate income people uh, called this place home and, and had for, for you know, a generation or two by that point, by the early 90s. Um, people felt that there was a lot of opportunity, but also felt that um, there were a lot of challenges in the neighborhood that they wanted to see get better. So that's really the background for our work. Um, so out of that, we crafted, uh, this is an illustration of our children's village vision. This was kind of the vision for uh, what could happen in this neighborhood. It wasn't a development plan. Um, as our director liked to say, it was an agitational vision to push the city uh, and, and other uh, agencies in charge, uh, you know, kind of investing in this place around a different way to conceptualize what was happening in Phillips. Um, so was, uh, this is just, again, not an actual development plan, but a vision of what could happen if you uh, invested in the local park, invested in more housing and commercial spaces. If you decked the freeway between uh, Phillips and Elliott Park, if you decked the freeway between uh, Whittier and, and uh, Phillips. Um, so things like that. Moving from uh, agitational vision to reality, what we did is we focused on the four corners of Franklin and Portland that I showed. So uh, over the course of uh, 15 plus years now um, with uh, uh, 
Khan, a, a large nonprofit uh, uh, affordable housing developer who I may, maybe some of you are familiar with working in the suburbs now, um, put together a plan and were able to get funded and actually develop all four of these corners. There are now about 300 units of housing, 70% uh, of which are affordable, 30% 30, uh, 30 are market rates. The affordable units are affordable to people at various income, le income levels, both 30 and 50% of the area median income. We have a couple of neighborhood commercial spaces uh, with um, uh, both of them happen at this point to be uh, to be operated by uh, Somali entrepreneurs. Uh, there's a daycare and there's a, and there's a corner market. We've got our headquarters in one of the buildings as well as a, a whole bunch of community space that we uh, operate all of our community engagement, our organizing, our leadership activities out of. We've got about 7,500 square feet of community garden space uh, on our different properties, uh, again, as a way of engaging people in the neighborhood. Um, this is just kind of a rundown of all those stats. Um, uh, so just pictures. The pictures help break up the presentation. But uh, that, that is our building on the first phase, <laughs> built in 2003. Uh, the Jordan, built in 2006. Uh, Wellstone, built in 2008. Um, and the Wellstone is a kind of an important building uh, in terms of getting to the, the fourth phase, the rows. Uh, the, the Wellstone was the first building where we'd always kind of had in mind this Again, this idea of sustainable, uh, healthy communities, but in terms of operationalizing it, um, in those earlier days, that was not something that any funders wanted to fund, things like sustainable design. By 2008, we were able to be part of the um, Minnesota Green Communities pilot project through Minnesota Housing, uh, one of the first uh, properties to really invest a little bit more. And we had to raise a bunch of private money to invest in um, sustainable building design elements for that property. So as you can see, there's uh, solar panels on the roof. Uh, at, the, at the time, it was the largest solar thermal hot water installation in the state. Probably not true anymore, but it was back then. <laughs> uh, we've got uh, rain gardens. There are three rain gardens around uh, around the site to manage all the storm water. Energy Star appliances, uh, you know, higher efficiency uh, systems throughout, et cetera, et cetera. Um, the Rose is the fourth and most recent phase. It just opened here in uh, about October 1st of last year. Uh, the Rose is um, I'm going to get a little bit more into it, but, uh, but it's a 90-unit market rate property, uh, which uh, really took on sustainability in a big way, and I'll um, get to that in just a minute. Um, I think one of the, I'm going to kind of slide through here pretty quickly, a couple of these just about HOPE's uh, community engagement work, uh, but I think what's important about HOPE's overall approach to community uh, development work is that it's not just about real estate, it's not just about, we don't do social services, but it's not just about kind of the individual work we do with people in programs. Uh, it's really about building social connections, about building kind of the infrastructure necessary for a healthy and vibrant community. Uh, that's both in terms of buildings, that's both in terms of the people and the way that they get connected within their community. So here's an example of our community gardens I mentioned. We have um, uh, a bunch of outdoor uh, spaces that are common for um, uh, residents in the area. Um, one of the cool things we've gotten involved with, which uh, I don't know if other cities uh, are interested in this, but um, Minneapolis the last few years has really taken on this idea of an open street. Uh, actually, I think it started in Columbia years ago. Um, and um, the idea is you shut down traffic uh, to vehicle traffic for a day. Um, you know, we have about a two-mile stretch of Franklin Avenue that uh, annually gets shut down for a Sunday for about five hours. And so uh, we've been pushing that. Um, it's a great opportunity for people to come get to explore the street by, by walking, by bike, by, you know, skateboard, by whatever. Um, and what we've used it as is a way to um, not just kind of get people to experience Franklin uh, on that day when there's no traffic because it's the one day of the year when that happens, but to really put that into an advocacy strategy around pushing the city and the county on making some needed infrastructure changes to Franklin Avenue, which is one of the most dangerous places for pedestrians, for bicyclists, even for cars. If, if you've ever driven on Franklin Avenue, it's not the most pleasant place to be, partly because of how it's designed. And so again, thinking about the infrastructure in our, in our community and how we can uh, either do it ourselves, like through our real estate, or how we can push the entities that control those things to make a better design, to make a healthier neighborhood, to make it a more vibrant place. Um, the Transportation Leadership Program, um, you know, Shelly said a lot of great things about their experience, and so I, I won't um, try to talk too much about it, other than one of the, the most meaningful reflections I think we had from this was the website direction. It had never occurred to me that you know, we, we were doing all this work around 
getting people, we were partnering with uh, groups like Cycles for Change to get people. We're partnering with Nice Ride, which is the you know the bike car at our at our site. We had all these things in our directions, which were written probably 15 years before <laughs> by somebody who just drove. We're just about to the office, and so I was like, oh, duh. So now we've got a much better uh, thing, which I send out everywhere now whenever people have an event at our at our space, and it's great because I think what that does is that normalizes, as, as Hillary was saying, it normalizes other ways to get to your site or to get to your event. Um, I think, what, as I was saying, part of why I'm talking so much about Hope's overall work is I think there's a big overlap between our office culture and the work that we're doing. So I think this idea, um, you know, Hillary had, had let me know that our, our site actually had, I think, the highest share for bicycling of the people in the a little bit surprised about, but then as I reflected, um, you know, so much of our work over the past like four or five years has been about um, healthy uh, alternative transportation options like Nice Ride and uh, Cycles for Change. And so it actually, I think it just kind of lends itself to the people working on those programs that get invested. Again, it gets more normal to them and it's just something that they adopt. So kind of just by the nature of working on something, you might change people's behavior. Um, and then, I, again, I mentioned the infrastructure piece that we're trying to change. Uh, you know, we've got a nice ride station. We're very lucky to have one at our corner, uh, which um, uh, makes a difference. But we've, we're on several metro transit. Uh, we've got bicycle lanes on uh, Portland and Park, which we actually got involved in advoc advocating for, uh, for changes to those a few years ago with the county. Um, uh, you mentioned our car. Um, that isn't to, to say, though, that we're, like, trying to stop people from driving, because we do have 300 units of housing. Uh, we have a lot of families uh, in our units, and we have a lot of people who depend on their cars. So um, what we've tried to do is, is really create a, a balance of options. And uh, again, as Hillary talks about a lot, is not provide over, you know, too much benefit on just the car side, uh, also providing benefit for using these other, these other modes, but still making it possible for families who need to drive to get around uh, through you know underground parking and trying to trying to make that a little bit better. Um, I mentioned the Minnesota Green Communities pilot with the Wellstone. So the roads, which is the building, um, the guiding framework for the roads is this living building challenge. I don't know if anybody here is familiar with kind of green design standards. Um, uh, if you've heard of LEED or some of those others, uh, living building challenge is like LEED on steroids because it's basically the the goals are are nearly impossible, I won't say they're impossible, but they're nearly impossible to get, but it's net zero energy, net zero water, uh, a whole bunch of other things which are really based too. So meaning you can't even get certified until your building's got at least a year or two of operating data to show that you're meeting these things. Uh, we took it on. Um, we will, we are hoping still to get some sort of partial certification. We can't meet net zero water. We can't totally meet net zero energy, uh, but we're pretty close. We've had a, about an 80% reduction uh, in the the building that we ended up with, from what the you know what a standard building would be in in energy usage, which is kind of incredible. About a 5,000 square foot community garden on site there. Um, I think I talked through some of these earlier. Um, you know, it's a mixed income property. It's 90 units. The living building challenge standard forces you to think about the site, the materials, the energy, the water, the beauty, health, and equity components of your design. Site is interesting because that is the one. Where are you citing the? Are you encourage multimodal transportation? A little bit of what the, the connection is here. Um, based on just where we where our work started, we we already had uh, a lot of things built in. You know, if you look at the, if you believe in the walk, walk score, bike score things, we, we're kind of at the top end of this because of being in Franklin and Portland. Uh, being a mile from downtown, uh, being a mile and a half from the university, uh, Lake Street, the Midtown Greenway is less than a mile that way, um, Minneapolis Institute of Arts, uh, Eat Street, all those things are just right there. So um, uh, we've got a ton of, that was a huge thing. But that doesn't mean that we didn't have to. Uh, unfortunately, we were still getting pictures, and I didn't have pictures. I, I couldn't show you, but what we did do is we had kind of a, a tiered bike parking. It's not, it, Minneapolis developments always have bike parking anymore, and they, you see the little racks outside, and they can work pretty well. But one of the things we found, and we knew from our own experience, my own experience as an employee who works at the, at the corner, 
is that the racks outside are great if you're there for a meeting for a couple hours, but if you're going to be there all day, who's going to, you know, going to leave it overnight, that's not where you want to leave your bike. thing in the world to steal because you just ride away on it. Um, and so what we did is we actually, we, have, we still have some racks that are outside for people coming to meetings. We have kind of an area over here next between our community garden space that a lot of people will come to, to take part in in the building. Uh, we had semi-public um, bike parking area that, that's more for kind of longer term, you know, so the employees who work in the site management office can use that. Uh, people coming to the community garden can use that. A little more secure, a little bit, a little bit less vulnerable, still in a basement in the underground parking garage, we took some dedicated we created kind of as in the in the university thing, not not nearly so big, but we created a parking area within the basement, which is for residents, so that's a much more secure spot. Um, so thinking about that and again normalizing the ability to have your bike there and not just have people kind of have to take it up into their unit and have to cram it into a closet or put it out onto a porch or something like that, uh, making it a little bit easier. So, I want to kind of whip through that. Um, happy to take any questions. And uh, Are there any questions online? Any efforts on Franklin? Well, there are efforts on Franklin, yes. Um, Where did you make any headway on? Well, so we have... Um, we we have been making progress. Our particular stretch uh, is tough. We're right there by the freeway entrance, and so the, the county really doesn't want to change that. But what we have coming in a couple of years, the I-35W is going to get redone through that stretch, and the Franklin Avenue Bridge is going to have to get replaced. I was part of the committee, so yeah. if you're not used to construction already, it's coming if you're over there on our side. Um, uh, the Franklin Avenue Bridge is going to get replaced. Uh, I was part of the, the committee working with the state, really pushing for the, the design includes bike lanes, wider sidewalks. Uh, the county is hesitant at this point to commit to what's going to go on either side, but the fact that that infrastructure will be built by 2019, uh, we think gives us a lot of leverage to push that they need to can't just have bike lanes that don't connect to something on either side. Uh, we know that there's there's bike lanes if you're down in the sewer part of Franklin. Um, there are bike lanes kind of way west, and so it's about connecting that middle stretch of Franklin with bike lanes. Uh, the city's identified it as a priority. The county has kind of loosely identified that as something they are okay with, I guess. <laughs> and then, and then the so, so they're super behind it. But no, you know, it, the the trick is, and, and I, uh, you know, the the county engineers are good folks. It, it, it is a tough stretch. There's so much transportation, so many different modes. You've got bikes, uh, pedestrians, buses cars, you got a ton of people trying to get through, and it's one of those things where it doesn't work great now, but everything, there's no perfect solution that everybody's going to be happy with, so I think what's always happened is the default just stays the default. Uh, so now we think there's a couple things that are going to force them to change it, and we're trying to keep being a part of that. I, I just find that stretch of Franklin fascinating from kind of that lens is that you have bike lanes on, on Franklin, mm -hmm. but the part that it's the least livable and least comfortable is also the area that has, I mean, I'm preaching the choir here, but the most mixed income and the highest diversity. Absolutely. It has a totally different component. It, Absolutely. It's frustrating to kind of see it and to prioritize it. Absolutely. When, you know, we've, uh, we've actually just recently hired a, uh, a community resilience organization uh, because we know that there's opportunity here um, to work. Uh, around kind of community health on Franklin, but particularly uh, one of them will be kind of crystallizing the support we know is out there from local businesses, from residents, to work with the county and the city to really to really show that, that that's not okay to so just ignore that stretch of Franklin. Love it. Well, another question has to be related to being next to the freeway. The idea of the tiny little particulates mm -hmm. that are within that quarter mile of freeway yep. and um, do you have ways of trying to, like, use trees or other filters to deal with that PM whatever point two five? Yep. Yeah, I mean, so um, certainly we've, we've tried to do a lot to invest in um, the 
in the outdoor greenery, trees, et cetera. But, but with the rows in particular in mind, the newest building, because that's right across from the freeway, one of the things that we really, we had to struggle with in terms of the living building challenge is um, we put in a dedicated outdoor air system uh, to provide fil filtered air to all of the units, filtered fresh air uh, to the units. It, it actually, though, it, it uses more energy. So, you know, we have the competing goal of fresher air, knowing that's right next to the highway, or, you know, if we had just dropped that system, we could have been like 85% reduction in energy use. But really, you know, so it's, we had to balance that, and I think we, I, I definitely was on the side of, of advocating for the healthy, uh, fresh air. Um, it's harder for the outdoor stuff, you know, just people walking and biking along Franklin, because I don't, I don't know what the longer term solution is. Um, I, I've never seen, I, I'd love to deck the freeways. I don't know if that actually does the same thing or how, how, what, how what the ventilation is like there, but I still haven't given up hope that we could do that someday. Uh, because it is, it's a huge, it's a huge environmental justice issue in that neighborhood, the, the 35 and 94 corridors. Yeah, Hillary. Um, when you were doing the rows or the other uh, developments, I'm just kind of curious about whether there were any particular steps for, um, uh, for um, pedestrian access or transit access. And, and part of the reason I'm asking is just that whole sense of how your location is rooted in that local and how you access by local modes seems similar to how cities yeah. are kind of there. And I also, to your points about the multi-ethnic uh, community, I know some of the cities around the state, you know, are very multi-ethnic. I was in Wilmer last year and huge Somali community downtown and Worthington. And, you know, so I think this question of how you integrate your location, both for multiple modes, but also multiple ethnicities. Mm -hmm. You know, but, but was there anything in particular in the ro in the rows that you said, okay, we're going to make this um, better for, I know you did like a transit well, stop, right? So, yeah, so we did secure funding um, in a couple of the phases for, um, for transit shelters, which now I kind of wish we hadn't because now there's that big federal grant that Metro Transit got, so they're putting them in any, anyway. But we, we we paid for them already, so we, we put in transit shelters at, uh, at two of the two of the phases because the number two bus, which runs east to west across Franklin, there um, high ridership numbers, but it never had shelters. Again, don't totally know why Metro Transit hadn't done that, but they didn't. So we put in shelters there. Um, when it comes to pedestrian access, one of the challenges we've had, and it's related to the Franklin infrastructure, is when you get a block west of our developments or a block east of our developments, you have some of the worst sidewalks in the city where you have, uh, because of the way that the, the right-of-way works next to the private properties that are there, you have some, you know, non-ADA compliant, like big time sidewalks where they have like poles in the middle of them and in the wintertime are completely impassable and, and wheelchairs use the street. Uh, and so to us, we, we haven't been able to solve that yet because it's not our property. But again, that's where the advocacy, that's where the organizing work uh, comes into play. Uh, and we are hopeful that uh, even if that's not the first step uh, of the infrastructure changes to Franklin, that, that is a necessary step to make that make those connections outside of our our property lines. Because we can do everything we want. I mean, we, we have really nice sidewalks. We have really walkable areas around our buildings. But um, part of it's about what's beyond our our property. Thank you. Thanks, Will. Thank you. Hillary, do you want to um, do the yeah. Q&A? Um, and also talk a little bit more about what workshops might cover. Um, but yeah, any other, before I get into that, any other general Q&A questions about the, any other general? You're on screen. I'm oh, sorry. Mm -hmm. Hi, screen. Mm -hmm. Hi, people. Sorry. Um, they had a backer. Uh, hi, backer. Um, <laughs> Questions again from the, the folks on the TV? Um, guess not. Any other questions here about um, practices? Um, so let me uh, let me just talk a little bit about what workshops could cover, just so you have an idea of a little bit about what that would be. Um, we have in the past limited these to about eight to twelve people. Um, it could be more than that, depending on what uh, what goes into the workshop. But um, we've thought of them about being like a half day. And if 
your location, I think as Diana mentioned, if you if you thought, okay, I want to do this and I'm I want to invite either staff or local businesses uh, or residents, and so you get that group size, then then we can come to you and we can kind of tailor the experience to your location. We can look at what the options are there. And we can try to build in those experiential elements. Um, one of the things that we made part of the workshop, um, in addition to the transit ride and the bike ride, was a walk audit so that you would kind of come across these kinds of issues like the telephone pole smack in the middle. And a little bit of education about, um, you know, that the planning staff would know, but the general public doesn't, of, you know, what composes the sidewalk and what is the amount of space that you want to have there. Uh, between the frontage zone and the, the uh, you know the rest of it to 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 have like true space for a wheelchair, um, but a kind of site specific sense of what are the options in your area would be a, a piece if there's enough people to kind of have a workshop there at your site. Um, we can also tailor some of these kinds of uh, content elements based on what you know your location might be interested in, but a deeper dive into the benefits piece. Um, how would you set that up? What are some of the tax elements? Um, we can do, um, in addition to like walk on it, multimodal uh, route planning um, and what apps are out there for this. Some of this is more applicable in the cities than otherwise, but you know, in St. Louis Park it would be, um, or Edina. Um, but also how do you use the tools that are out there to plot what your sample commutes might be? Um, how would you find that kind of carpool shed? Um, comparative costs of different modes. I think one one exercise that we've done in some of the workshops is to just have everybody um, put down what they are spending on how they're getting around and look at what the options might be. Um, planning locations uh, for events. Um, this is, is uh, some of the tools that are out there for um, say having event bike parking or um, ways to kind of stage things and also what what the um, levels are with Metro Transit about how big of an event earns you a um, free bus pass, that kind of thing, because they will do those, uh, but it has to be a big enough event. Um, mentioned benefits, uh, the amenities and other changes, um, staff encouragement, uh, activities and that, that different organizations have been done have done um, this travel behavior survey for your staff that that's a fairly minister um, to give you the mode share baseline so um, you also kind of take in any particular questions you might have about what you see as the options in your area so um, those are that's kind of an overview of, of what could be a deeper dive into some of these topics um, any questions about any of that at this point? So I'm just wondering, um, perhaps we should just send up a, a follow-up email um, to provide this option for uh, a city to contact you directly sure. about. Sure, that would be great. That would be great. All right, well, thank you very much. I think we're, we're done a little early, but that's never a bad thing, right? And um, thanks, everybody, for coming today. All right, so thank you so much. Hello, Ryan. Um, um, we will send out, as we always do, a follow-up with the resources. We'll put them up on the web. And um, uh, I don't know if we're going to do a survey or not. We'll probably actually um, do a survey um, about all of the workshops. Um, and, and so anybody who went to any of the workshops or viewed them online will get a survey. Please respond to them and really help us make sure that this is good quality time for you. It's, you know, it's, you know, it's a benefit. It works, et cetera. Um, so we really appreciate that. And um, anything? Oh, yeah. And so again, thank you to the McKnight Foundation, which provides funds for my time um, and Patrick's time to help put these together. Um, XL Energy was our series sponsor for the whole year, 10 workshops. Really, really appreciate their support. And then Transit for Livable Communities for um, sponsoring today. Really appreciated for um, putting, helping put together the agenda. It was a great program. Good. Thanks for bringing my old friends. Um, I appreciate that. You know, it's all about me right now. Um, so, three five. Enjoy Tuesday. Mm -hmm.